It's the Indie Horror Junkie Podcast. Your source for anything and everything indie horror. Here's your host, Otis B. Dreads. All right, it is 8 o'clock. You know where your indie horror is at. It's at the only place it's going to be, the Indie Horror Junkie Podcast, Indie Horror Junkie dot com as you see scrolling across the bottom there uh we're on facebook uh instagram um youtube obviously you may be over there watching us right now we got molly zombie uh in the uh in the chat right now welcome molly zombie um and of course uh indie horror junkie at gmail and if you uh if you have something you want promoted maybe featured the magazine which hopefully you guys got the newest issue the print magazines look absolutely fantastic um so hopefully you got your hands on on that rick they're probably flying out the door like hotcakes buddy i'm telling you they know my name at the post office now it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> well that's a good thing man we're mm -hmm. getting you were we're getting a fresh, you know, look, updated look, all your indie horror news in one place. And that's uh right here and at indiehorrorjunkie.com. Uh and man, the name indie horror junkie is is transforming from a digital magazine, obviously, to a print magazine and to a film festival. The first annual indie horror junkie film festival. If you're a filmmaker and you got a short, you got a feature, you're going to want to get it in within the next couple of days. Submission period ends the 20th. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're kind of prepared. We're prepared. I only have a few left to watch. So we're prepared uh, to take and uh, take that little bit of uh, influx of last minute. So please uh, go over to uh, Indie Horror Junkie Film Fest, uh, com. I believe I got that right. Indie Horror Junkie Film Fest, yes. Yeah, dot com. And uh, you can get all, you know, figure out all your submissions and, and all that stuff there. Get your film in. It's going to be a great time uh, in, in Orlando, the 2nd through the 4th of February. What a way to kick off February. It's going to be a lot nicer weather down there, I'm sure, than it is where I'm at. Uh, it's oh, yeah. It's absolutely freezing here. So that's one of the big reasons I'm uh, going down there and looking forward to that. But another reason is, well, all the great indie horror films that we're going to see. Uh, and we're going to have panels. We're going to have special effects panel. We're going to have uh, the guys from the inn and ladies from the inn, uh, a panel with them. We're going to have trivia, which may feature some, uh, some prizes, some indie horror junkie prizes. You can get your magazines there. This is where you need to be if you're, uh, well, even if you're not in the Orlando area, I'm, I'm flying down. So, uh, mm -hmm. and you can hang out with all of us junkies. It's going to be great. Molly Zombie is going to be there. If you're not mm -hmm. familiar with Molly Zombie, just go back and check out our show. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to see Molly Zombie. Uh, that's actually who this Facebook user is. See, I'm prepared today. I got the laptop over here. So I know who nobody escapes by uh wow there you go user uh jamie is here <laughs> welcome jamie hey jamie uh, and so it's gonna be a great time rick i'm i'm really looking it forward is. to it and you know what i i've i've, I've got to i've got to show off the mic here's another picture <laughs> here's 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 one picture look at these let me let me actually go back because you can get a little bit better look at look at those awards right there yep they turned out fabulous. Can't wait to give those away. And, and part of me doesn't want to, but we have to. I know. I know. I even mentioned, man, I want one of those just to sit on the uh, desk. Those are just, they're, they're, they're made really awesome. And I'm sure if I was a filmmaker, I'd want to get my hands on one of those. Just saying. Absolutely. I'm going to have my hands on that mic right there because I'm going to be going around. We're going to be talking to the the, the uh, con goers. Uh, we're going to be talking to some of the celebrity panels. It's just going to be an all out great time. You're going to get your indie swag. Mm -hmm. uh, we just want to make sure that when we get when we leave MegaCon Orlando, everybody knows that Indie Horror Junkie was there. 
We're going to have our faces. We're going to have our logos. We're going to have everything going on. We had a conference call yesterday with the great guy from uh, John Didana from uh, Phantasmagoria that's going to be basically right next to us. And in their own little room, they're actually going to come over. A couple of the lovely ladies from Phantasmagoria are going to come over and do a special dance uh, for the audience and stuff to uh, to show off what they've got going on over there. So we're doing a big cross promotion with them. And it's just going to be such a great time. I'm, I'm, I can't get more excited for it than I already am. Yeah, I, I can't wait. Um, it, it, it's, it's just going to be a fun time. That's, mm -hmm. all, that's all I can say. Um, so, yeah, again, to reiterate, February 2nd through the 4th uh, at the uh, uh, Orange County Convention Center yep. in Orlando. So uh, if you're in the area or if not, you can fly out. We'd love to see you. Come out and hang out with the junkies. Um, and 160,000 of your best uh, Congress <laughs> friends. Right. <laughs> it's a crowded one from what I've heard. Yes. I've never been to a MegaCon, but I'm preparing myself mentally. Just go uh, to the website and look at the guest list. I mean, everybody and everybody's coming. There. The whole cast from Back to the Future, Michael J. Fox, everybody, they're going to be there. So it's it's an amazing, unbelievable wow. lineup they've got there. It's Everybody's going to be coming out. Oh, man. So, uh, hey, if nothing else, you, you're just not going to want to miss it. Bottom line, if you do, you're going to kick yourself. You're going to That's right. It. Um, we, uh, also, also I like to take a moment. Uh, I am, um, actually going out to, uh, cause this is a busy, uh, first of the year for me. I'm going out to, uh, Texas in, uh, the end of March to do a little filming, uh, myself. Hellvira is haunted asylum of horror. Um, and, uh, going out there to, uh, play my role is, is Dave, the ascended stoner. Ascended stoner. Yeah. Does that mean like you're floating or uh, what does that mean? Or you're uh, ascending some stairs? What's, what's that? Uh, yeah. I, I, see, this is, it's all <laughs> kind of changed here lately because unfortunately uh -huh. Morgan didn't, you know, get, get, you know, uh, achieve the goal uh, and finances that he wanted to. Cause all, all you filmmakers know how hard it is to, oh, to yeah. raise the money. Every one of us knows. Everyone knows it, it's not an easy task, but yeah, so we had to make a little bit of uh, changes, and uh, I can't wait to read the uh, reprised version of the script. Uh, but that is also still over there on Indiegogo. So if you like to uh, still uh, go over there and donate, help chip in, uh, spread the word, even if you can't donate or, or you know financially, you can do the next best thing. You can just share it far and wide, and uh, maybe it'll reach hands with somebody who can. Right. So. Um, I think I covered all the bases. or did I, I? Did. I think you did. Let's get I to think, our guest. I, I think I did. Our guest tonight, horror author, uh, well, not just horror, but I, mainly horror comedy. We have uh, the Clown Prince of Darkness. <laughs> I heard that that was that was a nickname given his, uh, I guess, the genre that he writes mostly and he's most known for. Mr. Jeff Strand is here to give yes. you... His new nickname now is Bram Stoker Award winning author. There you go. And we're, yeah. Gonna, we're, yeah. And uh, also uh, quite the uh, comedian. Uh, check <laughs> this out. Hi. This is Jeff Strand, author of Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, the novelization, braving a barking dog in the background to bring you this informative discussion on how to tell the difference between a stress ball tomato and a real tomato. A real tomato can be eaten. I will not do so because tomatoes are disgusting. A stress ball tomato cannot be eaten without concerning your relatives. A stress ball tomato can be smashed against your face. A real tomato can also be smashed against your face, but with messier results. That's basically the only difference. Otherwise, the two are very much the same. Thank you. Indicated now. There you go. Welcome, Jeff. For more informative uh, videos like that, you saw you can get them at uh, Jeff Strand at TikTok over there. Uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. Uh, how are you tonight, sir? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Oh no, this is gonna this is gonna be a uh, this is gonna be a great uh, discussion, I believe. Uh, first of all, yes, Brom Stroker, Stoker, Stroker. Stoker, not Stroker. This is, this is a porn I, show. I do that all the time. I don't know why. I've, <laughs> I've just had a bad kind of day with words today. So uh, what was that, Jeff? I'm sorry. Very different kind of writing. 
Yes. 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 Very, very different kind of writing. And I mentioned that you have the uh, nickname, at least so says your Wikipedia. You have the nickname of the clown prince of darkness, uh, being that you write a lot of horror comedy. Yeah, I don't so think do you, anyone has ever called me the Clown Prince of Darkness, but I read things saying people call him the Clown Prince of Darkness, but I've never actually been called that personally. Huh. Yeah. I was going to well, say, which and, one would you prefer? The Clown Prince of, of uh, Comedy, or would you prefer Bram Stoker Award-winning writer, Jeff Strand? I think you should just address me as, oh my God, it's Jeff Strand. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, oh, it's the Clown Prince of Horror. That's what it was. Clown Prince of Horror. There you go. Yes. That, that's and and, and I and I will admit. I mean, I, I can see where that name comes from because I've read a few of Jeff's books, including Wolf Hunt, which is still one of my all-time favorite books. And Jeff has a very unique way of of thrilling you, getting you scared, but also making you laugh almost at the same time. And I've never encountered another writer that can do that. He does it very very well. And that was that was really that was really one of my my first questions for you is you know how difficult is it to write something that literally terrifies the reader that seems to be a, you know to me a hard task maybe because I'm not a writer like yourself but I mean is 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 that hard to write something that that that's terrifying because people when they read a book they obviously don't have the visuals that that are you know helping to 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 scare them it, it's all coming from them. Well, you can get more into the character's mind in a book. So you can, you know, it's a completely different process. Whereas a movie, you can have jump scares. You can't really do jump scares in books. You can have, you know, creepy atmosphere and all that. In the book, it's more, you know, in the mind of the characters. And so I tend to go more for suspense and thrills and stuff. I don't, you know, I don't really have my own equivalent of like Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, which is genuinely scary. I'm probably a little bit more on the thriller side. I have a lot of action in my books. So as far as, you know, what does it take to truly terrify the reader? I'm more the um, you know, edge of your seat suspense. People on the edge of your seat, suspense. right, right. No, no. What, no. What about the comedy side of it? Is it is it hard? I mean, I, I guess if you're just a naturally funny person, you know, it probably wouldn't be hard to to write a comedy. As Rick said, you know, he can he can you know get you on the edge of your seat, scare the pants off of you one minute, next minute have you laughing. I've seen some reviews that you know your your novelization of Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Uh, had people in stitches laughing out loud funny with some of the uh, you know reviews I heard. Uh, is that difficult or is that easier to do than keep people on the edge of their seat? It depends on the book. So something like Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, you're not reading it for the characters or the plot. You're reading it because it's right. hopefully a really funny book, which means that the book doesn't have any um, opportunity to not be funny. You can't just say, you know what, I'm these next two pages fine if we can coax it needs to be joke 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 it's like the movie itself or you know the airplane the naked gun you yeah. don't get to pause the jokes in airplane to focus on the plot or characters because it just it, that's not the type of story they're trying to tell right so that's difficult from the standpoint of you know there are bits where you have to figure okay how am i gonna keep the jokes flowing it's fun I think, you know, the really goofy comedy stuff is more fun to write than the horror stuff. I enjoy them both, but it's mm -hmm. more fun to, you know, be have the stupid stuff. But it gets more challenging when you're just trying to do a, you know, 250 page book that has to be funny pretty much in every paragraph. Yeah. Whereas when I'm doing a horror novel, I tend to layer the comedy on top of the horror. So when I'm doing, you know, it's one of my books that I consider a horror comedy. I'm not starting with a comedic presence and adding horror to it. I'm starting with a horror presence and adding comedy to it. And mm -hmm. there it's more natural because I'm trying not to be funny if it's not appropriate to the situation. So that's a lot easier. It just sort of, okay, this is something the character would say in that moment and then go on. But I don't feel like I have to be, you know, joke, 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 the way I do in a book that is a pure comedy. So I think um, probably the, in a book that is all comedy, the comedy is harder. In a book that is horror comedy, the comedy is easier. Yeah, because it seems like if it's all comedy, you have to keep that sustained throughout the book. And, you know, well, horror comedy. Very much. 
Usually I try to write books where you know you are into the characters and you are into the jokes. However, no one is picking up Attack of the Killer Tomatoes thinking, oh, I can't wait to find out what happens to Lieutenant Finletter or, you know, the, you know, they're reading it because it's supposed to be as funny as I can possibly make it. So. Right. And, and, you know, uh, I, I was I was thinking earlier while I was actually uh, watching the movie, I watched it again. And, and what a classic. Uh, typical, of, you know, of your 70s, you know, mid to late 70s humor, a lot of that. And it, it was just an all around, it's just a funny movie. Um, how, uh, you know, a lot of times you see books written in movies made after them. This, the, the, the movie was made and now you're writing a book based on the movie where we see a lot of times with, well, Stephen King, perfect example you know, writing all these novels and then movies are made after it. Uh, what made you want to go after Attack of the Killer Tomatoes and write a book about that? And is there any other uh, movie? Maybe I'm not aware of because you have such a large library. Uh, um, you know, is there any other movie that you like to, to take and do that with? Well, novelizations, you know, it used to be that, you know, before VHS, before you could actually get the movies at home, that was how you took a movie home. So you would watch Star Wars. You would love Star Wars, so you take the Star Wars book home, and that's how you read, you know, experienced Star Wars until the movie came back in theaters. And they were, you know, commissioned before the movies were made, usually before the movie was done being made. It would a lot of times be based on the screenplay. And you'd a lot of times do it for the money you're doing it you know it's a work for hire the studio would be really heavily involved telling you what to do you couldn't veer too far from it because people wanted that movie in book form sure and now movies are you know if i enjoy a movie in the theater it's if it's not already on streaming it'll be on streaming in two weeks so the idea that the novelization is your way of enjoying the movie until you have another chance to see it doesn't really exist anymore because movies are so um you know, easy to get yeah, access. Right. Yeah. Well, if you want to watch Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, you can you put in your DVD, you put in your VHS tape. You can, you know, there's a lot of ways to watch Attack of the Killer Tomatoes anytime you want. So just a literal putting the movie in book form doesn't really work anymore. So there's a publisher called Insight Apocalypse, and they've been doing what they call retro novelizations which are the assumption is you've already seen the movie probably lots of times. And now what can we bring to it? That's new. Mm. And if it's a more serious movie, a lot of times it's more backstory. It's like, okay, well let's get into, you know, how did this alien come to earth? What were the characters thinking? What new scenes can we add that go along with it? Attack of the killer tomatoes is a different kind of thing because it's just a pure ridiculous comedy. So what was fun with attack of the killer tomatoes was, to sort of treat it as if they had Marvel Cinematic Universe money to make the movie, because Tech Kill Tomatoes is really low budget. You know, yeah. the tomatoes are just these styrofoam looking things that roll across the screen. If they're about to turn, it cuts right before they turn. Yeah, right. I wrote the book as if they had, you know, $300 million to make it. So big, epic. <laughs> tomatoes versus giant squid battles and all that kind of stuff. It was really fun to lean into stuff that has not aged well. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes 1978 comedy has changed a lot. There's yes. lots of stuff in the movie. You know, it's a really, really funny movie. There are several moments where it's like, ooh, yeah, okay, this is definitely 1978 and not 2024. <laughs> so I got to, you know, acknowledge, I didn't try to pretend those parts didn't exist. I got to, you know, throw in little twists to them, fully acknowledge that not all of Attack of the Killer Tomatoes has aged well. The movie um, breaks the fourth wall. It sort of acknowledged that it's a movie. So the, for the book, I just went berserk with that. The book is aware that it's a book based on a movie through from beginning to end. So it's really just, you know, I'm not trying to replace Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. So I didn't, you know, recycle their jokes unless it springboards to another joke. Right. So I, it's all my own jokes unless it leads to something else. So, you know, one of the most famous jokes in the movie is, you know, can you please pass the ketchup? That's in there, but then it goes into a very weird, dark place. So I try to just bring my own, you know, it's very loyal to the tone of Attack of Killer Tomatoes. I'm not trying to veer away from what people loved about the movie, but I'm trying to bring my own stuff to it because 
the movie is 40 years old, 45 years old at this point, and you right. can watch it anytime you want. So what I need to bring something to it that is beyond the movie. So that's kind of why I wanted to do it. I felt Attack of the Killer Tomatoes would be the chance to just be as ridiculous as I could possibly be. People aren't precious, including the filmmakers. The filmmakers were not like, you know, you need to be loyal to these characters. You need to be loyal to the themes we have set up. You know, it was basically keep it as kid friendly as the movies are, which it's PG by 1978 standards. So it'd be a hard PG 13 if it came out today. Yeah. Basically, you know, keep it at the same level of family friendly as the, as the movie, but otherwise do what you want. And they love the book. So I had a lot of freedom because again, we're not being paid by a studio to promote an upcoming movie. It's a movie that everyone knows. So I could have a lot of fun with it have lots of creative liberties with it and just it was a lot of fun to write all right uh, um we have uh james michael roddy uh who has a question he says uh did you like the radio version of bad candy house that they did yes that i that's mm -hmm. a it's a fun story i it used to be my go-to reading so if I would stand in front of an audience to do a live reading, that was one of my go-to stories, just because it's funny and mean-spirited and good Halloween story. So very mean-spirited. <laughs> closely in my head. So it was a lot of fun to hear actors bring it to life, because it's a completely different take on the story. It was the same story, but very different take than what I'm used to. So it was a lot of fun to listen to. Just to give you a little backstory, Otis, in case you didn't know about that, uh, I have a horror radio show called Once. Uh, it's called um, No Sleep Tonight, and yes. uh, it's one of those. Yeah, it's a radio show, so therefore there's no visuals. And I, that was the first one episode that we did that was based on a story written by somebody else. And I went to Jeff since we were friends and said, "Hey, do you have a short story that we can kind of adapt to the show?" And he gave me that one, and I absolutely loved it. But it is very mean spirited towards the end. But James Michael Roddy is the person that actually played uh, the main character and pretty much, for the most part, the only vocals in the entire show. And that was just such a fun show to put together. We kept his script pretty close to what it was, almost exactly. We just trimmed a couple things here and made a couple tweaks here just to, for the radio format. But other than that, that was just such a great story. And I thought the adaption came out really well. We actually had Tom Savini in that one. He played one of the cops at the end. So. That's awesome. Yeah, I really. Uh, now, now, obviously, you're a horror fan, and and maybe more so horror comedy. Is that more your thing, or you, you know, you a slasher guy? You like the more serious horror, or just you know, because you write am, a lot of horror comedy. So, I love horror comedies. I'm kind of a. I love you know the wide range of what the genre has to offer. So I'm not, you know, specifically horror comedies. I enjoy a slasher movie. I enjoy a pretentious two and a half hour thought provoking horror movie. I kind of like it all. I'm probably more on the slasher side than the thought provoking horror movie side, but there you go. Me I, too. I enjoy it all. What do you think about some of the newer versions like, uh, like ready or not things like that? The newer takes on horror comedy, so to speak. I think there's a lot of really good stuff out there. I really liked Ready or Not. I, uh, yes. You're next, one of my all-time favorites. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. You know, when I'm doing short stories, I will get as silly as I can possibly be. When I do Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, I can, I'm as silly as I can possibly be. Most of my novel-length horror comedies, I try not to go too far. You know, I try to keep it at least believable not realistic at all but believable within you know whatever i've set up so when horror comedies get a little bit too goofy i i'm not as much into it as i used to be but i still enjoy all of it so what, what what's uh one of your one of your favorite uh horror comedies out there you can go as far back as as you want to young frankenstein i mean you can you can go wherever you want with this one uh, my all-time favorite, I've got the pillow right here, Shaun of the Dead. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. I mean, Shaun of the Dead is the pinnacle of horror comedy. It's never been done better. I think nope. it's, it works as good as a comedy as it works as a horror movie. It's mm -hmm. You're shocked at how emotionally invested you get. Because, again, it going back to what I said, it nails the tone. It is a very silly movie, but it never loses sight of the characters. Mm -hmm. yeah. so at the end you're like i this is a 
goofy, goofy movie, but I am 100% invested in the fates of these characters. And when they start to disappear, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking at the end. And one of my all time favorites by far. I, I have that, that big book that uh, uh, you've got read on you that yeah, I haven't I read yet. <laughs> yeah, that's a fantastic book. So there's, you know, Shaun of the Dead to me is as good as well, really movies get. I mean, the script is ingeniously constructed. Brilliant. So, you know, if you don't like comedy, it works really well as a horror movie. If you don't like horror, it works really well as a comedy. If you don't like either of those, it just works as a movie. It works on. It just yeah. works. So, and, and really yeah. on every level. I really do. And, and the thing I like about it too is that I've watched it so many times, and almost every time I come away from that movie, I catch something I didn't see before or something I didn't hear or, or whatever. And that's why I love it because just the comedy is just everywhere. And it's like, it, but like you said, it also is a very human movie where you get invested in those characters and some very serious tones and stuff that they that they talk about there. And the zombies were played straight. That's what I think really adds to it. So like you said, right. you could take it as a comedy, as a horror movie, or even as a drama. I think it works at every level. Right. The zombies are played straight. So the humor comes from the characters, but the right. tone is balanced so well that there's the bit near the end when I'm spoiling a movie, but this is an old movie. Everyone has yeah. seen Smile of the Dead at this point. When his mom has become, you know, yes. become a zombie, it's, it is emotionally intense. It's scary because she's a zombie, but it's also funny. The scene, it's a goofy scene with, mm -hmm. um, you know, well, it's not fair. Well, then he hands, you know, the other girl a broken bottle. So that's a fair fight. It, you mm -hmm. know, it's a goofy comedy, emotionally intense, scary, all in the same scene. It just, it, the balancing act is unbelievable with that movie. Uh, totally agree. Totally agree. What, so, uh, which, go, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I've asked okay. enough questions. Go ahead. That's okay. go I was going to say, uh, obviously, you've been writing for a long time, Jeff. Not that I'm calling you old or anything like that. If you don't get obviously I'm you're the name. Okay. But what were some of your inspirations? Where, where, where did Jeff Strand begin? Where did this whole idea of you being an author begin? And who were your inspirations that you really tried to, I guess, follow in their footsteps, so to speak? Or did you just decide? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to just be me and do my thing. Uh, inspirations came later. So as a kid, I loved to read, but I was reading uh, Judy Bloom, Beverly Cleary, Encyclopedia Brown, The Great Brain, that kind of stuff. So I just, I really like to read. I don't know how much those influenced me. The influences came a little bit later when I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> that just blew my mind. It's like, you're allowed yeah. to be that silly and have it be an actual book. I couldn't believe you were allowed right. to do that because my friends and I would write, you know, the stupidest stories we could, but those didn't count. Those weren't real stories. And then right. you read this book that is just insane. And then uh, Dave Barry's columns, which were, mm. you know, they're childish, but they're laugh out loud, funny. So I would say, you know, who was the strongest influence on my writing style? It would definitely be, um, a mix of Dave Barry and Douglas Adams. So then when I started to read horror, you know, I started with Stephen King mm -hmm. and I love Stephen King, but I don't write anything at all like Stephen King. Then Dean Koontz, who I loved, became yep. obsessed with Dean Koontz, don't write anything at all like Dean Koontz. Then I discovered Richard Lehman. It's like, oh, wow, mm -hmm. this guy does what I do, which is straight to the point, very little description, just tell the story. Now, had I discovered Elmore Leonard first, that would have been the big influence. <laughs> and I discovered Richard Lehman first. And so he was the first one where I was like, wow, this guy writes the way I want to write where I, so it's okay to not have lots and lots of character description. Cause to me, I don't need to describe the characters in great detail. I'm fine with it when you do, but to me, it was kind of like, you know, he's in his mid thirties, he's got brown hair. I do, I need that much more. I'm focused more on the dialogue and the personality. Right. So Richard Lehman, in terms of my horror writing, was the one where I said, yes, this is, you're allowed to do this. So this is what I'm going to do. So my writing style, I think in terms of, I try to do my own thing, but the influences come from a mix of Richard Lehman, Dave Barry, and Douglas Adams. Hmm. Okay. I do have two other questions for you. And then I'll right. let Otis take over. One of them is obviously you are a novelist. And I know that being a novelist and being a screenwriter are really two completely different animals. But you have also developed some of your own stories or written some other screenplays. Which task do you find harder? Is it easier for you to write a novel or is it easier for you to do a screenplay? And what are some of the biggest differences as a writer that you think? I think it's easier to do a screenplay, but I enjoy writing novels more. One thing, you know, in terms of, you know, once the movie's made, it's kind of nice that a novel is mine. Now, I work with an editor. 
So it's not like every single word is mine and no one else had anything else to do with it. It, but it's still, it's my book. You work with an editor. They say, you know, this part doesn't make sense. This part could be trimmed down, whatever, but it's still, it's my, you know, I stand by the book. Whereas with a movie script, you know, I've got one, the movie has not gone into production yet, but there I'm very proud of it, but that was me sitting down with the director in great detail. And then you have studio notes and there's a lot of stuff. So in the end, I'm proud of it, but it's not my vision. It is a very collaborative. So a lot of stuff like that. In terms of just the technical stuff though, a script is pretty much, you know, I don't have to worry about the description. I can just, here's what happens. I because I'm comfortable with lots of dialogue, those are the kind of books I write tend to be dialogue focused. So I'm, you know, with a screenplay, I'm comfortable with the format of just focusing mostly on the dialogue. So for me, that's easy. Although then I get the, you know, sometimes I'll get feedback. This isn't visual enough. And then I have to go back and rework that. But I just, for me, um, screenplay formatting is very comfortable. I think it's a ver format I'm very comfortable writing in. But I enjoy them both. I just think I think um, screenwriting is a little bit easier, but I think novels are more satisfying for me. Yeah. I like them both. I can understand that. All right, my second question was, and we kind of touched on this at the very beginning here, where you pump out books. It seems like every week I'm reading about a new book that's going to hit the shelves, and which is crazy to me because I'm a writer and I know how difficult it is. And as I'm getting older, it's becoming more and more of a, a real chore sometimes. I, I can have the whole concept and every word they're going to say in my head, but I sit in front of my computer. I'm like, oh, my God, how am I going to get this out? So I, I guess... What is your process when you sit down to write a book? Do you have a set process that this is what I'm going to do? I'm going to work so many days uh, of the week and I'm going to write for so much time. And do you have like a page count that you try to hit every day? Do you formulate the entire story first and before you sit down? Give us an idea of how it is that you do you and how you can pump out the insane amount of books that you do. Well, it varies a lot. It varies from book to book. The being prolific really comes from not wanting a day job. So I had a day job. I worked for an insurance company and I did it for 20 years. And during those 20 years, like, I wish I wasn't doing this anymore. So it was, there was strong motivation to work on the weekends, work on, you know, come home from a hard day behind the desk and then sit behind my own desk at home and just keep working because I wanted to Right. I didn't want to do insurance stuff. Now, I still, you know, I went to the Halloween Horror Picture Show, your excellent film festival. So I, Thank you, sir. Not, I didn't live a joyless, miserable existence. <laughs> I would still, you know, do fun stuff. But yeah. I also sacrificed a lot of free time. I didn't get to say, ah, the day of work is done. Now I'm going to watch TV this weekend. It was like, ah, the day of work is done. Now to start my second job. And then 20 years later and many, many books later, I that you know what, if I quit my job, if I have that time, extra time to write, I can do this full time, which is where I've been really for probably the past eight years at this point. And now it's based on, I don't want to go back to a day job. And I don't, if I sold so well that I could do a book every five years, great. I don't, I sell a level where I have to keep new books coming out, but I also have to keep them, you know, I have to bring my A game every time. You can't just crank out stuff because I need to keep the fan base that I've already cultivated. So if I, you know, I try to mix up stuff so I don't do every book is just action-packed creature feature. It's like, okay, this one was an action-packed creature feature. This one's a more slow burn psychological thriller. This one's maybe a goofy horror comedy. This one's maybe really dark and tense. So I try not to write the same book every time, but I try to at least let readers know I'm doing my best every single time because I don't want someone to say, oh, that book was garbage. I wasted my $3.99. There's no reason to buy more Jeff Strand books because for me to not crawl back to a day job, I need people who read my previous books to keep reading the new ones. Right. So yeah. sitting down knowing that, you know, I have to keep new material flowing or else I'm not making enough money to support myself is a really strong motivator. And, you know, it would be nice to say I can do one book a year, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I don't have that luxury. Maybe someday I will, maybe, you know, we'll see. But you have, but, do you have a certain system in place that you do for each book? Or is like you said, is it pretty much just different each time? Or do you have like a set schedule that these are my writing days, this is how much I want to pump out and stuff? Do you have like a like a format? 
No, I'm not as disciplined as you would think I am considering how much stuff I get out there. There is an element of the uh, student with a term paper where it's like, you know, oh, the book isn't due for another month. I'm, I can work on it just a little bit at a time. And then suddenly, you know, oh, the book is due in two weeks. Now I'd take it really seriously. And so it's kind of the amount of work I have to do sort of increases exponentially based on mm -hmm. how close I am to the deadline. Yeah. So I, it's kind of the procrastinating student with a term paper due model. <laughs> the amount of pre-prep I do depends on the book itself. Some stories require a lot of time just to make sure the story works. Like mm -hmm. my latest book is called um, Nightmare in the Backyard. It's a kid's book that'll be out in August. And it's essentially takes place, the entire book takes place in their backyard with Lovecraftian tentacles kind of bursting through the ground. And because it's such a simple premise, I needed to make sure that I had an entire book's worth of material there. I didn't want to hit the halfway point and say, man, I'm dry. There's nothing left to do with this. So that one had to be planned out pretty thorough. One, for my own benefit. Two, to convince the publisher source books that there was a full story in there. So I basically had to make sure I had, okay, yes, this has an entire book's worth of material. If there's a strong mystery element, I have to work that out ahead of time. I have a book called My Pretties, which is one of my really dark, intense ones. And there's a few big twists, and I needed to know those ahead of time to make sure I'm consistent while I was writing it. So I knew, you know, okay, here's where the reader finds this out. Here's where the reader finds this out. Here's where the reader finds this out. So I need to make sure that I know the third level of twist. And I'm not having to, oh, man, continuity are there, continuity are there, continuity are there. So like that. With a book like, say, Ferocious, which is two characters, they're in a cabin, they live off the grid, and the woods become infested with zombie animals. Hmm. And I knew that at the end of the book, they get their, their problem is that their truck was stuck in the mud three miles from their house. They left it there because they didn't think it was going to be a big deal. So they have to cross three miles through the forest to get to their truck. In that case, I didn't really need to know the whole story ahead of time, except that at the end of the book, they make it to the truck. So that case, I kind of just made it up as I went along. I knew it's like, okay, as I was writing, okay, how can I make their situation worse? How can I make their situation worse? How can I make their situ situation worse? But I didn't feel like I needed to work all that out ahead of time. I could just sort of have fun and keep it going. So um, it really depends on the amount of pre-production, to use a movie term I do per book, mm -hmm. depends a lot on how much the story actually needs. I don't like to just do really, really thorough outlines, but I also don't like to completely make it up as I go along because I found a lot of times I'll hit chapter six and just like, wow, I screwed this up. I wish I had thought a little bit further along because the plot doesn't actually work as well as I thought it did. So it depends a lot. You know, it, it really hit home with me talking about the procrastination. I don't know how many times <laughs> I woke up in, you know, fifth grade, had a science project due, had nine months to do it. And boy, on the day that it's due, I ain't got anything, you know. So, I, yeah, I understand that. Uh, what's do you have? And, and maybe I missed it. And in, in looking into, you know, you, uh, you know, doing a little uh, research before the show. Maybe I missed it, but I didn't see anything. Has any of your work been put to a movie? And would you like any of your work, uh, as we were talking, books to movies? Would you like to see one particular piece that you wrote uh, make it to the big screen? Yeah, there's a ton of stuff behind the scenes in production, or in not production, development, including mm -hmm. one that was through Universal, got me my WGA membership you know it's a full studio film kind of got derailed a little bit by the writer strike still you know looking good but i don't have any updates at this point on it and there's lots of stuff in various stages of early development and i you know there tends to be lots of interest that i just keep waiting to you know move forward i've written a couple of uh short films that you can find on youtube one is called hostile one is called, uh, well, guys, Gave Up the Ghost is not a YouTube the ghost. part of the anthology film, uh, Creepers. I think they have since rebranded it as Horror Anthology Film Volume 2. That was So I wrote the scripts for both of those. 
Um, Game of the Ghost was directed by Greg Lamberson. Um, Hostel was directed by uh, Brett Kelly. And then a film called um, Mindy Has to Die. It's a feature film. It was made, has not been released. I'm not sure if it is getting released. And that was based on my um, book, Stalking, you know? So I've had that movie. It played in some film festivals. I don't know what its future home is going to be. For the most part, it is lots of stuff in development. Sometimes I wrote the script. Sometimes I didn't write the script. I had a meeting about one today. And it's the process of getting a movie made. You know, when people say, don't ask yourself how a bad movie got made, ask yourself how anything got made. And I'm discovering that to be very, very true. It is getting anything made is really insanely difficult. And I have been lucky in that lots of stuff gets optioned, but I've also been unlucky in that very little of it has actually been in front of cameras that are turned on capturing, you know, actors giving performances, but there's a ton of stuff in development. And so I'm hoping that awesome. something will happen, but the maddening part is that for the most part, I'm not allowed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I had to get permission. You know, am I allowed to say I have something with universal? Yeah, you can say that, but don't say which book it is because if it doesn't go forward, then it looks bad for everyone. So right. it's yeah. um, one of those deals where it's, really cool stuff with a-list actors and a-list directors is happening but i have to you know don't don't say anything about it so i have to focus on the books for the most part but dude, there is stuff happening and i would really love for any of them to get made there aren't any where i'm like oh i don't want hollywood messing this up but you know there is stuff happening sometimes i have a lot of involvement sometimes i have no involvement whatsoever so we'll see well, one of those that I hope gets made, and, and I think you mentioned to me before, uh, I won't press you on it because I don't want to let, if this is the one, but Wolf Hunt, as I said, I cannot stress enough what a great novel that is. And that is the one, I'm not sure if you've done this on other novels, but that's the one that's had actually two sequels now, because there's Wolf Hunt right. 2 and Wolf Hunt 3. I don't know if you've had sequels to your other books, so I guess my main question is, will there be a Wolf Hunt 4? I don't think there will be a Wolf Hunt 4. There may be another George and Lou book. What I've just, my process for doing sequels, which is not the way you should be doing it, I tend to wait way too long. So Wolf mm -hmm. Hunt came out in 2010. Um, Wolf Hunt 2 came out, I think, in 2014. Wolf Hunt 3 came out in 2019. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it's the way you're supposed to do sequels, at least in book publishing, is you kind of, at least, you know, not too much more than a year between them. So I've had... Mm -hmm too long between the wolf hunt sequels my andrew mayhem series has had even longer gaps between the installments there are five books in the series and it took basically 20 years between the first one and the fifth one and then i did uh pressure which had 15 years between pressure and deathless if i ever do sequels again it will be back to back it will be you know all three of them will be written and then they'll just knock them out one after the other well, so, not trying to not trying to press you at all, but it sounds like you've had four to five years between each wolf hunt, and I, it's been four years now. So, just saying. <laughs> I, I'm not in any way ruling out wolf hunt four. I there did we think go. maybe I would this time I would just go with George and Lou and just have mm -hmm. those main characters off on a different adventure. It's a great characters. I was, I was pretty happy with the way Wolf Hunt three ended. Wolf Hunt two ends with the expectation that there's a Wolf Hunt three. It's not a you know shocking cliffhanger but is unresolved and then the third one i tried to you know if there isn't a wolf hunt four i tried to leave wolf Hunt three in a good spot but it doesn't say there can't be a wolf hunt four and i may do it at some point but okay we'll awesome uh you know we've talked to you know a lot of filmmakers and the process of making a film there's there's a lot of speed bumps involved uh getting you know promotion getting uh your movie or in this case we're talking your your books uh out there distribution always seems to be a big deal with filmmakers from the time that you have the idea for a book to the time that it's in book form and on the shows what's the most difficult part of that whole process from you know is it more difficult to get the book on the shelves what have you found or has it been fairly easy for you 
Well, I self-publish a lot of my stuff. So getting distribute getting distribution is very easy because right. Okay. You know, that, that part is easy. Um, uh, my work for younger audiences is, you know, a big publisher source books, but that's, you know, selling the first one was difficult, but I'm now on my seventh book with them. So the process of selling a book to them because I'm a known commodity is basically just, here's the book I want to write. And then if I can convince them that it'll make a good book, they offer me a contract and I write the book. So there's not in, in terms of the actual publication process, there isn't a real difficult stage. There's a lot of work to it, but in terms of the big challenges, that's mostly on the book writing side. The part that I enjoy the least is the very last step. So when I'm working with a publisher, I turn in the book and then I work one-on-one -on -one with the editor. She reads it, sends her comments. I address all of them. I send it back. She then sends it on to the copy editors and they're looking at the more minute stuff. They're in comma placement, you know, that kind of stuff. She sends it back to me. I go through the changes, address all that. At this point, I can still change anything I want in the book. Hmm. Then I send it back and then I get what's called the advanced reading copy. And that is the one that goes out to reviewers. And that is basically the book. However, it is the book where I can still make, I can still fix mistakes. So if there's a typo in it, if there's a continuity error, we can fix that. But I can't fix stuff just to fix it because they've already made the book. So they'll send me a printed copy. It's it's labeled, you know, advanced reading copy, reviewers, you know, uncorrected proof. And at that point, I can change stuff that is an actual error, but I can't change stuff just to change it. And that is when I will have the worst reading of the book of them all, because that's when I'm reading. It's like, oh, I want to change this. I want to change this. Okay. I want to change. Oh, it'd be funnier if I did that. It'd be funnier if I did that. But I can't. That is the book is 99.9% .9 locked down. And that is when it's the most frustrating because it's just like, oh, man. Now, of course, the previous reading was the same book and I didn't find anything I wanted to change. But what it's like once it's locked in. Yeah. Then you start finding as, everything. Yeah. Right, it's the same thing as you know, proofreading and proofreading and proofreading and proofreading. Then you send the email out and then, oh, there was a typo in it that I discovered mm -hmm. two seconds yeah. after I clicked send. It works under the okay. same principle where my least favorite reading of the book will be when I can't really change anything. So that's, yeah. you know, it's not a frustrating, maddening thing, but that is the most difficult part is that where all you can change is if it's an actual error because you're not supposed to be messing with the margins or anything like that because it's been formatted and the book is basically done. So that's the hardest part for me. Uh, what is, uh, what, what's the biggest piece of advice that you could give to a young writer right now or somebody who, you know, wants to get in and, and, and start, you know, author authoring books What's the biggest piece of advice that you could give? I mean, persistence, and uh, you know, has to be one. Just like in the filmmaking uh, business, uh, you got to be persistent. You got to, you know, you got to stay at it and stay at it. It doesn't happen overnight. Nope. Uh, I hope I just didn't steal your piece of advice. Well, no, but... that is definitely <laughs> part of it. Persistence, um, thick skin, because one, you'll get rejected. A lot. If you try to go the traditional publishing route, there will be many, many, many rejections in your life. And then if you get the book and the book comes out, there'll be many, many bad reviews in your life. Sure. You know, no book that comes out is universally beloved. You will, you know, if you have, if people really enjoy your book, you'll still go online and see one star. This book is so horribly written. I don't know yeah. how it's even a real book. You know, that's, if you, have a thin skin if you can't handle criticism. Any creative arts are wrong for you because you need to grow a thick skin. For the younger audiences, it's more about um, writing is about practice. And there's a belief that you kind of sometimes think people think you need to nail it with your first book. And that's not true at all. Your first book does not need to be published. It's like if you try to pick up a musical instrument, you're not going to be good at it right away. If you want to be a football player, you're not going to be a great football player right here. You practice. You go to practice for sports. You practice musical instruments. And you have to practice for writing. You don't go to practice for writing. You're sitting at your computer or writing in a notebook or whatever you want to do. 
but it's a practice and your first book may be terrible my first book is was unreadable then i wrote another book and it was less unreadable and then after trying again and again each one got better and then i hit a level where i was doing publishable work and so for a kid you know if i'm if a 12 year old says i want to do what you do good do it just sit down and write a book it's probably yeah. not going to be great if you're a 12 year old and you write a publishable novel you're a you know genius and that's fine but it's probably going to be terrible and then you just keep doing it there's nothing wrong with having you know five or six or however many there is no rule to how many books you have to write before you write one that's good and it used to be trunk novels so you would write a book print it out say either you would decide this isn't good or your friends would read it say that this isn't good or editors would say reject it this book does not suit our present needs eventually you'd retire the book and it'd be called a trunk novel these days people don't actually put stacks of paper in a trunk but it's kind of the same concept is yeah i guess now it'd be a hard drive novel it's just and yeah. there is nothing wrong with writing a 400 page book that no one's ever going to read it you learn something writing it and your next one will be better so that's things don't be scared of the practice novel because it's part of the process yeah i mean that and that's great advice and i think that goes across the board uh you know i, I was a horrible uh you know, host when I first started getting behind the mic, it, it it took some practice. I was nervous. And then it got to the point where my mic presence was better. And you, you have to, I think doing something like this is an art form radio, you know, things like that. Um, but you know, that's, that's great advice. And, you know, I, I kept it going and, you know, we hear that a lot, you know, with the filmmakers uh, that, that we've had on, you know, if you want to make a movie, just do it. You, mm -hmm. you don't you don't need a big budget, you know. And like you said, Jeff, hey, it's probably going to stink. Your first one's probably going to stink, but you're going to learn a lot from it. So it wasn't, you know, a bad thing. Uh, right. You know, you, you you need you want to make those mistakes now and hone your craft, uh, right. and then and then just keep that keep that ball rolling. Um, yeah, most people any who have long running podcasts will say, you know, don't listen to those early episodes. They were rough. And oh, yeah. No, I'll, yeah, I'll tell you the same thing. <laughs> well, I think uh, Robert Rodriguez once said something about uh, with, with regards to filmmaking. He said, basically, it's like, just do it. Just go out and make it. You're going to make some horrible films. It, it, it's just the process. That's what has to happen. He said, but the bottom line is that if you can look at your first film and then you can look at your last film and you see a progression, you know, then you're doing the right thing. If you don't, then it's just a hobby. Right. So now, I think that's, element, that's the same thing. Filmmaking, there's an element of fiscal responsibility. You know, it doesn't cost anything to write a book, whereas you don't want to yeah. max out your credit cards and not be able to feed your family because you made a terrible mm -hmm. movie. So it's a little bit different, but you can yeah. get on your phone. You can practice the techniques. You can do short films. You don't yep. want to just say, you know, we're going to make a feature. We don't know what we're doing, but we've got $50,000 in available credit. Let's do it. Sometimes that has worked out and if they're inspirational stories, I feel like the vast majority of the times they're like in crippling debt saying, okay, well, that was a mistake. But you can definitely practice your craft. You can start with short films. You can, you know, in these days with cell phones, you can, you know, learn the That's techniques true. and then raise the money. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I was, I was just getting ready to bring that up. I mean, you can go out with one of these brand new iPhones and and a handful of your friends and make a short. Uh, you know, you can you could sit down and write a short story. You know, they don't have to be Stephen King's seven hundred thousand page you know books that he wrote. You know, it don't have to be that. I always thought when it came to filmmaking that you know, because I've talked with some people, you know, guys in in the past who want to get into filmmaking, and they they talked a big game. They never directed anything in their life, and talk a big game, talk a big game, and nothing comes about it because they soon realize all the work. All the things, you know, they, they, they dreamt big, but they, they couldn't, you know, produce anything. And I always told him, you know, because he wanted to, you wanted to start, you know, with a big feature. I'm like, man, it seems like it'd be a lot easier if you just start with a short. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's cheaper. I mean, you, you, you don't need a whole lot. You, you can you can make those early director or in your case, Jeff, you can make those those early mistakes as an author, you know, with a short story 
you hone your craft and you shoot for bigger things. And yeah, so that seems like uh, the way to go. Uh, Jeff, any last minute uh, uh, things that you want to bring up? I think you mentioned you didn't really have a whole lot going on. Do you have any new works, uh, any new ideas for new books? Are you currently writing anything now that you can tell us about? Oh, there's always new stuff. There's always yeah. stuff. No, I know. I, 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 I should have guessed. <laughs> yeah, I should have guessed that answer. <laughs> I'm, it's, I'm like three books ahead right now. So I've got um, It Watches in the Dark will be out in April. And then I mentioned Nightmare in the Backyard will be out in August. And those are both um, kids' books through source books. So they'll be available anywhere books are sold. Awesome. And so um, those two. And then I've got more adult stuff coming up and then I'm working on lots of stuff behind the scenes. So my latest release was Veiled, which is sort of Veiled, a yes. psychological thriller with a great big plot twist. And my last release before that was Demonic, which is more the nonstop action, you know, really gory horror comedy fun. So I try to mix up the tones a lot. And then Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was sandwiched in there. So yeah, there's always new stuff. My website and all that information is scrolling along the bottom. So if you go to the website, there's always new stuff coming out. There you go. So, uh, and you can find him on Facebook, as you can see, scrolling across the bottom. Uh, you are Sal's, uh, one of his favorite uh, writers. I don't know if you All saw right. that. Hi, or... Sal. Yeah. So, uh, got, got got some fans out there. Jeff, I want to thank you for uh, taking some time uh, with us and and talking about uh, being an author uh, and and all all your different uh, you know works and and it's been a fun conversation. Uh, I learned a little bit. I can't say I'm going to pick up the pen and start writing because I'm already busy enough. <laughs> I got enough on my plate. But uh, hopefully, uh, this inspires uh, some people too, uh, regardless of their art. Because your piece of advice can stretch all across the spectrum of, you know, creative arts. Stick to it. Be persistent. Have a thick skin. Um, great stuff. Uh, if you can, Jeff, just stick around while we close out. Love to say bye to you uh, off the all show. Right. Um, and uh, hey, you you have a you have a great uh, rest of your week. Look forward to. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to get me a copy of uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Uh, I did. <laughs> Did you? I've got yeah, quite, a, I've got quite a few. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to start boosting my library. I haven't bought a book in quite some time. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. Well, yeah, all right. Thanks, Jeff. That's been great. All right, thank you. All right, Jeff, stick around, buddy. We'll talk to you here in just a minute. Uh, man, that that was a fun conversation. Yeah, he's friend. he's a great guy. I've known him forever, and it's like he was uh, when I first started doing film festivals. Uh, he used to come to every single film festival up until I think like like I was almost twenty years in or whatever. And we used to boast about he was the one guy that has sat through every single film at every single film festival I've ever done. I've done quite a few, so uh, he's just a great guy. He's fun to talk with, but he is. He is uber talented. And like I said, I can't recommend enough. If you, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, I just bought. But if you like werewolves, get Wolf Hunt. That is such an amazing story, such an amazing, fun read that is unrelenting. And I could easily see that as a movie. So I've always talked to him that one day, if I get the funding, one day, if I hit that lotto, I'm going to be coming to him and getting the rights. And we're making that freaking movie. So definitely check it out. That's awesome. Uh, you know, writing was something I kind of, you know, I, used, yeah, I was big into, you know, writing poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, that was more that was more my thing. Very abstract type stuff, because I didn't want to think about words that rhymed each other. So I was just abstract and dark and all over the place. But that wasn't where I was meant to be. So uh, that was just a hobby. Uh, but I am where I'm meant to be, I think, right here in the Horror Junkie Podcast. Don't forget, every Wednesday, mark it on your calendar. Uh, I, I very, We very rarely hear, oh, shucks, I missed it, because we got some people and uh, you know that are that are taken in there every week. I want to thank everyone in the, uh, in the comments that joined in, everyone who is going to catch this on the uh, rebroadcast on the, you know, the going back and watching again. Thank you. House of dolls, midnight horror show. The awesome show. We appreciate that. Um, and well, you know, let's see next week. Oh, I almost forgot, but not this week. Uh, next week we have miss Christina green model, special makeup effects. Uh, Indie horror hottie. Indie horror hottie. 
Uh, mm -hmm. There you go. God mm -hmm. help us. Secret Santa. Uh, is this, uh, is it Sam, Samu Slick? Bam, is Sam oh, Sammy, Sammy Slick Vampire Slayer. Uh, Sammy Slick Vampire Slayer. Uh, some of the uh, things that she's known for. So, uh, mm -hmm. well, we'll leave it at that. Uh, you know what they say in the biz, don't you? We'll see you next Wednesday.